people might not like talking about it, but everybody in the hospital needs to poop. And in this video, I'm going to go over how I put my patients on a bowel regimen to make sure they don't get constipated in the hospital. Also, I broke my sunglasses from the last video, so I'm very sad. So let's just get straight into it. So here's my website that I've been making with a bunch of residency guides and medical school guides. The first one I want to talk about is this bowel regimen page that I've made here. I really wanted to make this because I feel like when I started intern year, um, a lot of the practical side of medicine, I don't think was really taught to us. You know, we learned a lot about the theoretical stuff, all the rare zebras that we might see, but not really just like common issues that are going to happen to every single patient and that we need to be aware of. And so I thought it'd be useful to have a small repository of this kind of information to look at as needed while you're in the hospital. So my approach is that everyone admitted to the hospital should be on both Miralax, which is polyethylene glycol, and Senna. The Miralax is a dissolvable powder that they drink every morning. And from what I've heard, it's a very neutral tasting powder and is a pretty good agent. It's actually got the best evidence for reducing constipation while patients are admitted. And then the Senna is kind of a stimulant laxative, which we give two tablets every night at bedtime. And if you want to, you can just do the Miralax alone, but usually we order both the Miralax and Senna. Like as soon as somebody's admitted, I just put Miralax and Senna on at the same time. One thing that you'll learn quickly if you're at UC Davis is that you should never order Docusate. The evidence for it really is very poor and it's basically a waste of money, but it's kind of just a vestige of what people used to treat constipation with. It's one of those stool softeners and basically every physician ordered this in the past. And so when you go through the admission order sets, there's always Docusate there, but the evidence for it is really bad. And if you look at these articles that I linked here, uh, you'll see that there is a lot of evidence for Miralax, as I mentioned before, and some of the other stimulant drug, um, laxatives, but basically Docusate is the same as placebo, if not worse. So here you can see, it is interesting to note that in clinical practice, Docusate salts are still commonly used, although the evidence base is nominal compared to that with polyethylene glycol. And then things we do for no reason, prescribing Docusate for constipation in hospitalized adults. The authors extrapolated their data to suggest that total healthcare spending in North America on Docusate products likely exceeds $100 million a year. Multiple randomized controlled trials have failed to show any significant efficacy of this drug over placebo. So I'd really recommend going over those couple articles. They're really good reads about why we don't use Docusate. So basically your default again is the Miralax and Senna, but if your patient is still not pooping, I think your second line agents should be these magnesium, magnesium salts like milk of magnesia and magnesium citrate. Also oral bisacodyl or Dolcolax, which is another stimulant laxative that's a little bit stronger than Senna. So the milk of magnesia is really good, um, but both of these you want to avoid in patients with renal injury because it can lead to magnesium toxicity. And of the two, I would probably lean a little bit more towards milk of magnesia just because the milk of magnesia is only 30 to 60 milliliters of volume, whereas the mag citrate is 296 milliliters of volume. So it seems to me that the milk of magnesia is basically as efficacious, but has less chance of volume overload in patients with renal disease or or heart failure, for example. And then the oral bisacodyl is really, really helpful and definitely something you should try out before moving on to further steps. If your patient is still not pooping, uh, the really you know strong heavy hitter is lactulose, which you can do up to basically 30 milligrams every two hours until they have a bowel movement. It's very good at making people poop, but the big side effect is bloating, which can be painful or cause nausea and vomiting. I've had lots of patients who became so bloated that they started vomiting and they aspirated. So that's definitely something you need to look out for if you're going to be giving them a large amount of lactulose. And then you should also start trying some medications from below. So the bisacodyl, we tried oral from above, but you can also do a suppository from below, which is very, very effective at getting things to contract. And you can do enemas, which are uh, include tap water, lactulose, and mineral water enemas. They're all basically equivalent. Um, the only thing is that I prefer to start with the suppository before enemas because the enemas are really messy for nurses to deal with and take up a lot of time. So if you can, try to do the suppository first. And finally, avoid sodium phosphate enemas in patients with AKI or end-stage renal disease. And our last resort option is Go Lightly, which is basically what we use for bowel prep. It's a very, very large amount of volume, but this will really make people go. The problem with this is I actually had a patient early on in intern year who 
basically went into flash pulmonary edema because of how much uh, volume their bowel prep was. I'm not sure how common that is, but that's something definitely to be aware of is that, you know, so much volume, it can be dangerous in some of your patients who are not very tolerant of lots of volume. Another thing that's good to know is the mechanisms of action of each of the laxatives that you're prescribing. So we've got several different mechanisms of action. We've got osmotic, stimulant, softeners, and bulk forming laxatives. So the osmotic ones are going to include Miralax, Lactulose, and Go Lightly. And their main side effects are bloating because it just causes a lot of gassiness for a lot of patients. The stimulant ones are really going to help the bowels contract. Um, but the side effect of this is cramping. For stool softeners, we have Docusate, but again, it doesn't really work very well. So don't ever prescribe it. And bulk forming laxatives include psyllium, which I actually really like. It works really well for irritable bowel syndrome because it treats both constipation and diarrhea, which is very interesting. And then just some extra points for you before we move on to our next video. Opioid-induced constipation is very common in hospitals, and the treatment for that is reducing the opioids, but also using methyl naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. Um, if a patient is coming in with a massively dilated bowel that's just not working or contracting at all, that's called Ogilvy syndrome, which is colonic pseudo-obstruction. And the treatment of Ogilvy syndrome is neostigmine, which you should avoid in bradycardia and patients with bron risk for bronchospasm. And you should also correct their electrolytes, especially potassium, which plays a very big role in normal colonic movements and peristalsis. Also, remember that sometimes a patient with diarrhea actually might be constipated and they're having overflow incontinence. So basically, they have such a firm stool ball that's there that they're just getting leakage of fluids from around that, and that's why they're having diarrhea. So sometimes the treatment for diarrhea is actually giving them an aggressive bowel regimen. All right, that's it for my brief approach on bowel regimen. I hope that was helpful for you, and if you enjoyed and found it useful, please like, comment, and subscribe. And in my next video, I'm going to be talking about electrolyte repletion, which is something you're going to be doing a ton of in the hospital. So just click right here, and we're going to talk about electrolyte repletion, which you're going to be doing all all day as an intern and we're going to figure out exactly how to get that person's potassium back to a good level. So thanks for watching and see you in the next video.